forward to this. I'm looking forward to your questions at the end of the show as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, well, it is that time. So let's go ahead and begin. And of course, I have to start by saying, May the fourth be with you. Welcome everyone. My name is Matthew. Thank you for joining us here at the Sandwich Public Library for this very exciting uh, time together for um, a awesome presentation. We're gonna be hearing from Dan Z. He's gonna be sharing with us Star Wars and the Hero's Journey, a literary adventure. And you can see that there on his uh, slides. Um, I. I just shared with him, I said, I might be the one who's most excited for this. I, I've come in my Star Wars shirt. I've got my uh, Darth Vader cup here. And so um, I, I'm thrilled to be uh, hearing from Dan tonight. And I hope that you all enjoy and, and uh, can hear more about what Dan does and uh, are able to uh, connect with him online in the future. Um, so uh, let me just give you a few instructions again, as we've had some more folks joining us here. If you uh, have just come in, you can leave your name in the chat box and how many people are viewing with you. And then I'll write that name down and we're going to do a drawing for Dan's new book that um, has just been published. And uh, so that'll come at the end. In the Q&A, feel free to leave your questions throughout the program. And then at the end, I'll ask all of those, as many as that we're able to get through. Um, so thank you again for being here. And Dan, thank you so much for sharing May the 4th be with us, uh, Star Wars Day. We're thrilled that you're here. And uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for having me and welcome everybody to our to our little presentation today. My name is Dan Zare. I go by the name Dan Z on the podcast, the weekly podcast, Coffee with Kenobi, that I am proud to be the host of. It's been, it's going on, Matthew, next week will be eight years I've been doing Coffee with Kenobi. We're, tonight, we're going to talk about Star Wars, a literary adventure in my day job. Let me see if I can advance the slides here. There we go. In my day job, I am a high school teacher. I teach seniors at the high school level, and we teach. I teach mythology, I teach British literature, and I teach composition. And then at night, I do this incredible thing called talking about Star Wars with so many people from all over the world. And I love it. I, I have written, as Matthew so graciously said a little bit ago, I've written the Star Wars book, uh, casually left behind me, you know, just, just in case you're curious about the Star Wars book, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later in the show. But I'm going to talk about the Star Wars book naturally. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about how Star Wars is a literary adventure. Now, literature by definition is basically... Let me see. I'm having a heck of a time. There we go. Literature by definition is language. It's beautiful, exquisite language. Now, Star Wars is a language in and of itself. And I'm not just talking about dialogue. What I'm talking about when I say language is the cinematic language, the way that Star Wars comes to life on the screen or more ap accurately for this presentation off of the page. There's a lot of great Star Wars literature out there. And there's a lot of great stories about Star Wars. And really, what is it about? It's about the characters. It's about the humanity of these characters and how they come to life, how they leap off the screen and they move us and they inspire us. Now, a big reason for that is because of the hero's journey. So if you are familiar with Star Wars or you're familiar at all with popular culture, you've undoubtedly heard of the concept of the hero's journey. The hero's journey, and this is a, a beautiful image here, a very, very famous one where you see Luke Skywalker, he's on Tatooine. He, this is his home desert planet, home of, of course of two sons, the twin sons. And he's always thinking about what else is there for me? You know how when you're growing up or maybe you feel this way right now, you just feel like you're meant for something. And you're not really sure what that is. Maybe you've already found that. Maybe you've already through your hero's journey. And maybe you're still looking for it. Maybe you're actually on the path right now, wherever you are, we can all relate to that hero's journey. What I tell students is think of how you feel when you're a freshman compared to how you feel when you are a senior. You are invited to take these steps into a much larger world 
that you don't know anything about. They can be frightening, they can be exciting, they can be scary. But ultimately, what does it force you to do? But it forces you to grow, it forces you to change, it forces you to mature, and it forces you ultimately to be the best version of yourself. Along the way, you'll have trials and pitfalls and challenges. You'll run into friends who become allies, who become friends. There will certainly be enemies. Sometimes those enemies are from without, and some of those enemies are within. But either way, we all have our own hero's journey. So George Lucas, of course, is very, very familiar to Star Wars fans because he created this spectacular galaxy a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. We know that. But did you know that there is, there is a, a great man uh, who's no longer with us? His name is Joseph Campbell. Now, he, he was a literary theorist, and he studied mythology. He's just a brilliant man. George Lucas was fascinated by Joseph Campbell and the work that he did. So he came up with the, the, the concept. His most famous book is The Hero with a Thousand Faces. This is a, a book that basically says, hey, all of these stories that we like and that we relate to so much, they've been happening for centuries. And what he believed, it's a very Jungian archetype. Carl Jung is a, is a famous psych, psychologist. And he believed that we have something called a collective unconsciousness where we, we have, even though we're not always sharing and talking with each other about certain things, there are just certain things that inspire us because we're human. There are certain things that scare us. There are certain things that, that motivate us. There are certain things we seem to be connected in, even when we don't really understand why. For evidence of that, look at the history of Greek, ancient Greek mythology, right? There were numbers of stories around, the, around Greece. Now, it was very, very hard, of course, for people all around Greece before technology was the way that it is now, certainly, but to share stories with each other because there's so it was so far to travel. But somehow, all of these people from ancient Greece came up with these ideas of characters like Zeus, uh, different characteristics of Zeus, what he is like, uh, Athena, all these different characters. And sometimes the names would be a little bit different, but ultimately they always, they found out that they were more connected than they were different. Carl Jung was fascinated by this uh, through dreams and psychology. Joseph Campbell believed it carried over through stories. Think about Beowulf, think about the Odyssey. Think about Harry Potter or J.R.R. Tolkien, or of course, Star Wars. There's so many aspects of these stories that we're so drawn to because they have these similar archetypes. So George Lucas was fascinated by Joseph Campbell's work. In fact, Joseph Campbell at one point referred to George Lucas as his most famous student. And I think it's hard to argue with that. Now, there is a popular sort of a misnomer out there that George Lucas wrote Star Wars because of the hero's journey. But actually what's really true is that he was inspired by the hero's journey, but he's also inspired by a lot of things. He was inspired by Flash Gordon and old radio serials and old science fiction, but ultimately he wanted to bring hope into the project. And that is exactly what he did. When Star Wars was created, it was, time, it was during the time of the Vietnam conflict and there was a lot of gray in the world and Death Wish and films like that. And he wanted to bring some hope and some optimism. He wanted to introduce what the mythology is into America. He felt like America didn't have a great modern mythology. Of course, there was King Arthur. That's really more from France or, or England and all these other great stories. But Star Wars is what he felt like would be the great American mythology. So ultimately, he tells this story. Now, the hero's journey has three major phases to it. Okay, so I'm going to show you all three of them. And we're going to go back and talk about each one. So first we have the departure, then we have the initiation, and finally the return or the voyage home. Okay, so the departure, think of this. There, there are several steps in the hero's journey. Some people say there are 12, some people say there are 18. A lot of people have taken them and run with them in a lot of different places. There's a lot of great interpretations. We're gonna focus on Joseph Campbell's today. So the departure essentially starts out with some sort of a call to adventure. And while I'm telling you this, I want you to think about the original trilogy, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, or Return of the Jedi, or think about the prequel trilogy, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith, or finally, the sequel trilogy, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. They all follow these steps. So in the, the initial step, the departure, the hero gets the call to adventure. They are in the comfort of their, of their known world. They feel safe, but they might feel a little bored or a little laissez-faire about life feeling like there's something else for them. I showed you that picture a little bit ago 
of Luke. This is where he's about to get his call to adventure. Suddenly something happens and the hero is asked or invited to leave the comforts of the known world and to go off into a place where the rules and the limits are just not known. You're not sure what's going to happen. And it's a little scary. So ultimately what the hero does is they refuse the call. They say, you know what? You know, in Luke Skywalker's case, he says, you know, it's not like I like the empire. I hate it. But there's nothing I can do about it right now. He talks about having to stay and help his uncle. And there's just all these things. So typically when the hero refuses the call to adventure, they, they say they've got responsibilities or maybe they're afraid or maybe they think they aren't worthy. And you could probably make a case for Luke on all those things, but ultimately he leans on responsibility. He's not sure. Eventually something happens and the hero decides, I am going to. And if you want, think about Spider-Man. Spider-Man, in fact, almost any popular culture story or your favorite book or video game or movie will follow this. But Spider-Man gets his call to adventure. He gets bitten by a radioactive spider. He certainly refuses that call. And ultimately something happens that shakes him to his core and he decides to accept that call. When that happens, the hero gets what is known as a sacred talisman, as well as a mentor. A sacred talisman is essentially an enchanted weapon or some sort of piece of armor or some sort of device that helps the hero along their path. So in the case of Luke Skywalker, we have probably the most famous talisman in modern popular culture, and that would be the lightsaber, naturally. And if you were in my studio right now, you would see lightsabers all over the place. But of course, you can watch that on Facebook Live every Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. on Coffee with Kenobi's Facebook page. So, and we do talk about the hero's journey that because it's really interesting. So you get the sacred talisman, you get your mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi is naturally Luke's mentor. He looks a lot like Merlin for King Arthur, and that's not an accident, right? You've got this wise, older man that's certainly got some mysticism about him. Luke comes from this unknown background anyway, and all the great heroes do. It's pretty rare to see a hero in the hero's journey that has the father and mother with them along the way. It happens, but it's pretty rare because ultimately the hero has to leave the comfort of their known world and they have to grow up. Eventually they decide, okay, we're going to do this. I've got my mentor. I've got my sacred talisman. I'm ready to just move forward. And then we have typically the most exciting phase of the hero's journey, the initiation. In the initiation, the hero goes on a number of tests, meets a number of allies, and runs into a lot of enemies along the way. At some point, the hero encounters a phase known as crossing the first threshold. When you cross the first threshold, this is your, your, the furthest you've ever been from home. It's, your, it's almost often a geographic location where you're leaving the, the comfort and the safety of the known world into a place where, again, the rules are completely unknown. For Luke Skywalker, when he crosses that first threshold, is when he goes into the Moss Eisley Cantina, when he goes into, into, uh, into Tatooine, into Anchorhead, and he realizes, well, this is different. He walks into the cantina. Uh, people try to kill him. He doesn't even know how to order a drink. He finds out that the bartender doesn't serve droids. All these rules are completely unknown to him. Then he meets an ally, a very famous ally, of course, named Han Solo and the legendary Chewbacca. And then eventually they get onto the Millennium Falcon, my favorite ship in Star Wars, by the way. And he flies off. Eventually he crosses a very famous place in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And that is the belly of the whale. When you cross, when you go into the belly of the whale, you're completely separated from the known world into a brand new place. There is no turning back. You are completely trapped inside this, but it also shows that the hero is completely willing to completely cut that cord and go into this dangerous new world. For Luke Skywalker, when he does that, it's inside the Death Star. Now, does he go into the Death Star willingly? Not necessarily, but he is aware that once he boards the Millennium Falcon and leaves the comfort of Tatooine, that things are going to be very different for him. So eventually, uh, one of the most challenging parts of a hero's journey is when the hero loses their mentor, the death of the mentor. I mentioned Spider-Man before, of course, with Uncle Ben. But in this film, in A New Hope, Luke Skywalker loses Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi sacrifices himself so that Luke Skywalker can escape. And once that happens, Luke runs into something that is very tricky. It's very tricky for us. We will run into this in our own hero's journeys, in our own real lives. Eventually you lose your parents or you lose your mentor figure. Sometimes that's because of death. Sometimes it's because they move. Sometimes it's because you don't have access to them for whatever reason. But in a classic 
Jungian archetype or a Joseph Campbell version of the hero's journey, the mentor dies. The reason this is important is because when the mentor dies, the hero is suddenly very mortal. They're faced with their mortality and they realize, I have got to survive on my own. I don't have Obi-Wan Kenobi. I don't have my mom. I don't have my dad. I don't have my aunt or my uncle to take care of me. I've got to do this on their own, on my own. And it's scary, but it has to happen to propel the hero forward. Once that happens, uh, then the hero eventually gets to, to a place where they're, they're faced with a, with a, with a, a spiritual crisis. Um, and when that happens, the hero changes. The hero dies sometimes. Sometimes the hero will die physically, a physical death. And sometimes the hero will die um, a psychological death or, or very much a, a complete seismic shift in the way they perceive the world. So when this happens, this is called apotheosis. Apotheosis is, is death and rebirth. If you die, you come back to life. Think about Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He does die, comes back as Gandalf the wife. He's stronger and more powerful than ever before. For Luke Skywalker, he doesn't die a physical death in A New Hope, but he does die spiritually to an old way of thinking. I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about this because we're not, we can't interact on this particular Zoom call. But what do you think Luke's apotheosis is? Where does he go through a complete spiritual change, a rebirth, a reawakening to a new way of thinking? I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about it. All right. So for Luke, he's in the X-Wing. He's going down the Death Star Trench when suddenly, and we've seen this happen with Gold Leader before, everybody's using their targeting computers to hit that small thermal exhaust port right below the main port, and it, it's not working. Luke does, may not necessarily know all the ins and outs of that. I mean, he's pretty much still just a fresh-faced farm boy from Tatooine, a moisture farmer. But suddenly he hears the force through, he hears Obi-Wan Kenobi through the force, and he says, you know, he asks Luke to trust his feelings. Luke turns off his targeting computer. Uh, let, he says, let go, Luke. So Luke turns off his targeting computer. He fires that shot, heard round the galaxy, that shot that's worth one in a million, according to Han Solo, and he blows up the Death Star. Think about that for a second. He's not using technology. He's not using what he's tethered to or what he trusts. He's using his instincts. He's trusting in something that he can't see. He's very unfamiliar with. But because he does, because he trusts in the force, he blows up the Death Star and saves the galaxy. He, sa he certainly saves the rebellion. Now, of course, other things happen, and that's part of the fun, uh, building the tension in, in the drama and the story. But ultimately, Luke dies an old way of thinking. I don't have to trust the old ways. I've got this new, exciting, mystical energy field. You know, the force is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us. It penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. When he does that, that's his apotheosis. That is his death and spiritual rebirth. And he's changed. He's reborn. After that happens, we've got the return, right? Luke returns to Yavin. He ultimately will end up returning to Tatooine, as we see here in this picture of Return of the Jedi. But he returns and he's he's a whole different person. Your job when you're the ment when you're the hero and you return in phase three of the hero's journey and Campbell's hero's journey, your job is to take everything you've learned from your experiences. And, chain, and go back and teach where you came from. Teach everybody what you've learned so they don't make the mistakes that you made so that they can grow and be different and be transformed because you have as well. Now, there are several individual phases within inside this one as well. Often they're not really explored in an initial story like they used to be. If you're familiar with the Odyssey and my freshman students, when I taught freshmen certainly are, when Odysseus who has been gone uh, from Crete for 20 years, 10 years in the Trojan War, and then 10 years going across the ocean trying to get home while Poseidon keeps him from coming home to his to his family. When he eventually comes home and destroys the suitors, he suddenly feels lost because he's so used to traveling. He's so used to being away from home. So he leaves again. Odysseus has a hard time with his return. Luke Skywalker, you could argue in the sequel trilogy, he suddenly has a hard time as well because he leaves too. It's, I guess one of the messages is when you leave and you're transformed, it almost awakens something inside of you where you 
are constantly exploring, constantly looking for the next adventure. And I think we as adults, or certainly as, as young people can relate to this as well. You go to college, you come home, but then you feel like, wait, I've got something else in me. So you go to your job or a new profession, or you you move away from your, from your birthplace. And it's very exciting. I mean, there, there are so many phases and aspects of the hero's journey. One of the things I do at Washington Community High School where I teach is I have students, we watch A New Hope because hello, I've got to do my due diligence and teach everybody to appreciate A New Hope. After we watch that, I have them find a story that they like and they talk about the hero's journey that they notice in the stories that they love. And it's amazing that they see all the connections because they're all there. They're all there. Most stories have pretty much all the aspects of the hero's journey. If you think again about the stories that you love, you'll notice that as well. So why does any of this matter, right? Can't we just watch these stories and enjoy them? I mean, sometimes my wife will say to me, Dan, sometimes the curtains are just yellow. Sure, but I'm a literature teacher. So come on, of course, there's more to it. It matters because it shows we've got more alike than we do differently. It matters because these stories speak to us. One of the biggest things I miss about going to the movies over the past year and a half is that that collective audible cheer. If, if you watch the Marvel highlight reel that they showed yesterday on social media, they show the sequence in Endgame when Captain America gets Thor's hammer and everybody erupts and all of the heroes return from the five-year snap. And those cheers are electric. I have goosebumps just talking about it now. It matters because we respond to these stories. We see something in these heroes that resonates within us. It inspires us to be better. It inspires us to dream big and it inspires us to look at the top of that horizon into the twin sons of Tatooine and realize there is something I am supposed to do. And I don't know what that is, but I am going to search around the galaxy and find my destiny. It's very exciting and we can all relate to it because if you're really honest with yourself, I have a hard time believing that you sit there thinking, I'm okay with being mediocre. No, I don't think so. Maybe you're just afraid to take that first step into a larger world. Maybe you haven't gotten your opportunity yet. Maybe you don't know where to look, but ultimately we all want to take our hero's journey and we see these characters we know and love so well. We see them take their hero's journeys. It propels us to go to galaxies never ever explored before. It's fascinating, it's brilliant, and it's great fun too. Again, think about the stories that you like and I think you'll find a lot of these aspects there as well. So there are certainly a lot of books that we can talk about uh, that I want you to think about uh, as far as, certainly they have the hero's journey, but they're just fun and exciting Star Wars books. That's, that's certainly the case. So uh, I've, I've compiled a few of them for you to think about. So Star Wars has a number of books out there a lot of incredible pieces of fiction that are out there that I think people will really love. I, I picked a couple to, to suggest that you may want to take a look at. So on the very left uh, is Bloodline by Claudia Gray. I actually have two Claudia Gray books up here because I think she just is a terrific writer and she writes Leia extremely well. But Bloodline takes place right before The Force Awakens, a few years before The Force Awakens, this tells a very compelling story to me uh, back in 2015. If you're familiar with Star Wars literature, then you know there was the Star Wars Legends line, which became, or was the expanded universe, became known as the Star Wars Legends line. Think of King Arthur to help explain this. But basically, there are a number of versions of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table that contradict each other or that conflict, but they're all fun stories. Well, Lucasfilm had this incredible cornucopia of books, but they didn't always gel. They didn't always connect. So when Disney purchased Lucasfilm, they said, you know what? We're going to start from scratch. All the stories that you know and love, they're still out there and we love them too. And we will draw from them for inspiration, which is what a great mythology does. Draws from the tales of yesterday to create stories for today and the future. And they decided, let's connect these stories more intricately and more emotionally within the films and the animated stuff themselves. So Bloodline is the story of Leia, who uh, may end up being elected, basically being in charge of the entire uh, New Republic. But because of a political rivalry, 
it ends up coming out that she is the daughter of Darth Vader. Now, the galaxy didn't know this. A select handful of people did, but it wasn't exactly a very popular thing to find out that you're related to Darth Vader, who's, of course, the ultimate big bad in the galaxy besides Palpatine. So when everyone finds out, Leia loses her political clout, and she ends up forming the Resistance. It is a great book. Han's in it. Chewie's in it. Uh, I believe Ben Solo's in it as a baby. But it's absolutely brilliant. I don't think you'll go wrong. Again, it's my favorite one. In the middle is, is a very, very new series of books known as Star Wars The High Republic. Now, this series takes place 200 years before The Phantom Menace. Yoda is younger. He's still older than most people, but he's younger because he's, he's 900 years old in Return the, in The Empire Strikes Back. This is 200 years before The Phantom Menace. And there are Jedi all over the place. When you hear Obi-Wan Kenobi in A New Hope say, for a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights are the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. This is it. The High Republic is the Old Republic. And Avar Chris is the, is the Jedi front and center here. You've got um, a Wookiee Jedi. You've got a Trandoshan Jedi who's inside the book named Scar, S-K-A-R-R, I believe. And it's written by Charles Soule. It is a New York Times bestseller. It is a tremendous book, but it introduces this concept of what are the Jedi afraid of? And there's this new series of enemies in the High Republic books. And there are a number of them. There's, there's adult novels like Charles Soule's Light of the Jedi, which is one you should read first because it kicks everything off. There are young adult ones. There are middle grade books. There are kids books. There are a lot of comics. And they all tell the story of basically the Jedi at the peak of their powers. And they are somehow interrupted in the galaxy. Peace is interrupted in the galaxy because of the Nile, N-I-H-I-L, a group of Basically, they're, they're pirates without any kind of remorse or conscience, and it's scary, and it challenges the Jedi in ways that they've never been challenged before, but it's, it's brilliant in Star Wars fans, and the mythology of Star Wars has really kind of taken a whole other level of anticipation and excitement because we don't have anything to go on for this, so it's really cool. On the right, another Claudia Gray book. This is Leia, Princess of Alderaan. This is the book of Leia where she first learns of the rebellion. It's, it's how she is training on Alderaan to eventually be the queen of Alderaan, of course, before events change her destiny. And it's a fantastic book. It, it shows Admiral Holdo. If you're familiar with Admiral Holdo from The Last Jedi, it shows how she and Holdo become friends. It shows her first sort of uh, notif uh, realization that she's force sensitive, even though she isn't aware of that. And it's brilliant. And, and as I should have said, if I didn't already, all the books since 2015 are canonical. Can canon is an old term basically meaning law. It's, it's actually comes from church law, but it means canon. These all are the law of the story. These are all the things that count. So when you're reading these stories or any stories from Star Wars since 2015, they're all part of the Star Wars canon. So they there's a, there's a series of incredible people known as the Lucasfilm Story Group. And what they do is they they make sure it all works. They make sure it all connects. I mean, are they perfect? No. Is anything perfect? Not necessarily. Of course not. But they do a really, really good job of making these stories count, making them matter, and making them all work together like a good, strong mythology does. And I'm pretty sure the minstrels and the storytellers from thousands of years ago, if they had this option, they would have liked it as well to keep all the stories connected and cohesive. All right. So as far as other versions, we have Star Wars The Heroes for uh, this presentation. These are nonfiction books. Now, uh, J.W. Rensler worked for Lucasfilm. He's written one for the making of Star Wars, the making of The Empire Strikes Back, and the making of Return of the Jedi. There's one for Indiana Jones. He's got, he's got some others, but it's absolute brilliance. He has taken, as a researcher, which we know, uh, if, especially if you're a, a person who goes to the library or reads or has, has ever been in college or in high school, which I would assume most of you have been, you have to research to find information. What he did is he looked through diaries and old documented conversations and listened to old recordings and pieced all this stuff together through newspapers, through old interviews. Uh, what happened when these stories were created? They almost take on a mythology themselves. My favorite one is the Empire Strikes Back one, and not just because the Empire Strikes Back is my favorite Star Wars movie, but because it has a number of pages with gorgeous, gorgeous images. I mean, these are coffee table books. They're huge. And 
it walks through the decision of Han, of Harrison Ford to say, I love you. Or when Leia says, I love you, and Han says, I know. It walks through that decision from his perspective, from Irvin Kirshner, the director's perspective. What did George Lucas think? What did Lawrence Kaz and the writer of The Empire Strikes Back think? Ultimately, what did Carrie Fisher think about this? It's amazing. Again, it's a story unto itself. And then the creation of Star Wars, the original Star Wars, is practically legendary. Um, the struggles that George Lucas went through, through his health, uh, the financial risks involved in making a film that no one had ever taken a risk on for a long time that they didn't think was actually going to work. Uh, it, it's just tremendous. I can't recommend these two books enough. In fact, every summer I read them because they're just, they're so rich with the stories of how this stuff happens. And if you look, the one for Star Wars is, is the Ford is by Peter Jackson, of course, the the person responsible for the film versions of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, and then Ridley Scott, uh, Frey Empire from the from the Alien franchise, and Blade Runner. Not well, yeah, and, and Blade Runner too. Now, the, here's some resources and some miscellaneous stories. On the left, we have William Shakespeare's um, "The Merry Rise of Skywalker." This is by Ian Desher. Ian Desher is he has a doctorate in, of liter of of theology. He's a brilliant man. He's become a good friend of mine. I actually worked with Ian as he created the three books, the prequel books. But what he does is he went through all nine Skywalker films and he rewrote them in, in perfect Shakespearean iambic pentameter, the rhythm of how you talk uh, and how Shakespeare talked. And he rewrites it in beautiful language that's still digestible and easy for people to read and enjoy who aren't uh, English teachers or people who like Shakespeare, because that certainly happens for sure. And I absolutely love them. Again, I'm a little biased because I helped. Um, I was basically just a resource for Ian when he was asking me questions about the lore of Star Wars. I was very fortunate to be a part of that. But even before that happened, he'd written Star Wars, um, um, Verily a New Hope, it was called, and then the Empire Strikes Back version and Re Return of the Jedi. And they're just brilliant. I mean, for me, as a as both an English teacher and a Star Wars fanatic, it was a dream come true. I think you'll absolutely love them. Actually, what he does with the Phantom Menace and Jar Jar is brilliant because he turns Jar Jar into this genius who doesn't think he's going to be taken seriously. So he acts silly, but to try to make things happen to help his people. But the internal monologue, which Shakespeare is so great at, is revealed that Jar Jar Binks is actually a brilliant strategist. It's just a really really clever way to tell the story and I, I loved it. On the right is the Star Wars book that I was lucky enough to write with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton who has written a number of Star Wars books as well. This is basically a series of curated essays that looks at the Star Wars mythology, it takes the books, the movies, the comics, the stuff on Disney+, Plus, all the animated things, and tells the whole story together I was able to really explore Star Wars and, and like I said, write a bunch, a number of essays about a lot of the characters, about the Force, about some aliens and things like that. It's, I mean, I'm certainly biased, but even if I wasn't lucky enough to be one of the writers on this book, I would still absolutely recommend it, whether you're a novice Star Wars fan, whether you don't know what a Wookiee is, or whether you're an expert, there's a lot of incredible information here for you that I think you will absolutely really, really love. All right. So what questions do you all have for me? Oh, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. I was sitting here taking notes. And, uh, oh, good. Uh, yeah, we've got some questions. If you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box or, of course, in the chat box, and I'll add those to our list. Um, I want to start off by asking you, how has the hero's journey helped you to navigate your own life? What a great question. Uh, honestly, it's helped me a lot. I mean, I certainly, as a lot of us, I think, do on occasion, I went through a, a, a pretty substantial refusal of the call. Uh, growing up, I remember first giving a speech in high school and standing up in front of the class and, and thinking, wow, I love this. But then I just kind of put it in the back of my head, right? I didn't want to take those risks. Then I worked in insurance for eight years. And the entire time I did it, while insurance is a very, very important profession, we absolutely need it in our society. I just didn't feel excited or inspired. And in the back of my brain, I kept thinking about teaching and I kept telling myself reasons why I shouldn't do it. Eventually, I stopped refusing the call and only started thinking about reasons why I should do it. Once I did and did take my first journey into a larger world, I went back to school in my mid-30s. I became a teacher. Because I became a teacher, I met my wife. 
because I met my wife. I eventually started coffee with Kenobi. And now I'm here talking with you, Matthew, and everybody here on the Zoom call. I mean, I just think it's so incredible that, you know, the allies you meet along the way. Uh, often in real life, the enemies you face are your own inner critic, right? Am I good enough? Am, am I going to do this? When I became a teacher, I said, what if I can't make any money? And no, no, that's not true. People said to me, what if you don't make money? What if you can't find a job? What if your students don't like you? All these things that can tend to tell you no. And all I would think is, no, I have to do this. I don't know why, but I know that there's something out there that I'm supposed to do. And, and, and it's, I mean, I think it's in so many of us. I really do. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Well, we've got some questions rolling in here. The first one's a very fun question from Becky. Was the Wil Wilhelm yell in all the movies or just A New Hope? The Wilhelm scream is in a, a number of Lucasfilm uh, movies, including a lot of the Indiana Jones movies. I think they stopped doing it. Uh, I, I don't remember if it's in The Force Awakens or not, but I know it's in the first six Star Wars films. Yeah, so Becky, the Wilhelm scream is very much there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you believe when a Sith Lord is struck down by their protege that their spirit uses them as a living vessel, hence they don't truly die, but live on through that vessel. Oh, this is an excellent esoteric Star Wars question. So, and actually we explored this a little bit in the, the Star Wars book, but no, I do not believe that. I think that's why it was so insanely, incredibly hard for Palpatine to come back in the Rise of Skywalker. And we can certainly talk about the pros and cons of that. But uh, what the Sith want is they want to control the force. That's why Palpatine wants to stay alive. That's why Darth Plagueis wanted to stay alive. They don't believe there's anything after. They don't believe there, there is the cosmic force that you connect with. They're just all about the living force and what is in the now. And they're very selfish and want to control. So there's no way they would ever entertain the notion of I can be a, a part of the universe and be a part of everything else in the force. No way. It's all my show. That's one of the reasons why the Sith, they can only handle being two at a time, that rule of two, because they would never ever embrace the notion of working with the force. They wanted to control the force. So when they are done, they're done. Yeah, cool. Uh, another question come in. Aside from Star Wars, what would you consider some good modern examples of the hero's journey? Sure. Well, um, I think the Marvel stuff, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is full of very, very rich, contextually rich and character-driven, incredible hero's journey stuff. I mean, all the, 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 the Avengers solo films, definitely Spider-Man, probably the best example out there. I think Harry Potter is wonderful and is, is, is almost textbook hero's journey. Those are the ones that come to mind right away. Batman certainly has one. Basically, superheroes uh, give us a lot, of, a lot of meat on that hero's journey bone, I would say. What upcoming Star Wars projects that we know of um, from Lucasfilm are you most excited about? Well, the Bad Batch, as many of you know, debuted today on, on Disney Plus, and it's uh, a series of five clones that are, are genetically uh, modified uh, for, through experiments and end up becoming having almost superpowers uh, in a way, like the leader hunter has enhanced senses. Uh, Wrecker is, is very, very physically tough and brawny. Even in fact, in season seven of the Clone Wars, he actually lifts up a Republic gunship because he's that strong. You've got Crosshair, who's a sniper, an expert marksman. And then you've got Tech, who is um, intellectually superior to most droids as, as far as his processing goes. And then you've got Echo, who was a clone. Boy, I'm really a nerd. I guess this is a good time to be a nerd about Star Wars when we're talking about this on May the 4th. Um, he has a, a hand socket and he's also... A brilliant combat strategist as well. So I love the Bad Batch. I think it's really, really fun, really well done. The stuff I talked about before on the High Republic is outstanding. Um, and there's a lot of other cool stuff too. I mean, the Disney theme parks and the Disney Cruise Line are going to have a lot of incredible Star Wars experiences as well. So I'm excited about, honestly, all of it. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, what is some of the best Legends content? Sure. The best, well, Legends, again, the stuff that I was around for a long time. I love, uh, I got a number of stuff here, but the Timothy Zahn books 30 years ago, Air of the Empire started, and that was pretty much the thing that between that and Hasbro releasing a new version of Star Wars figures that were very muscly, that, that it's kind of a legendary thing in collecting, but 
Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Chewbacca, they're all very ripped and muscly. So the, that came out the same time, around the same time as Timothy Zahn's Heir of the Empire, most famously because, excuse me, of Grand Admiral Thrawn. And he's a brilliant mind and brilliant strategist. So anything with him is great. Um, there's a, a series of books where Luke Skywalker tries to restart the Jedi Order. And Luke is very interesting in the expanded universe because, or the legend time, because he's often portrayed as basically like a god, small g. And he's so powerful. And I, I still kind of think that's why some people, not me, were disappointed by The Last Jedi because they thought that was the Luke they were going to get. Of course, that wasn't the case. And uh, for my money, The Last Jedi is about is brilliant. And I thought it was a great portrayal of Luke and his humanity, which is why I think that story is so strong. But back to your question, the legend, the legend line, uh, the, the Thrawn stuff is great. Uh, Gendy Tartakovsky is an animator and they finally released these 2D Clone Wars shows on Disney Plus. For a long time, you can only get them on old DVD or Blu-ray copies. No, it was just DVD. It didn't even have Blu-ray. But there's some great legend stuff there. There's a great episode. In the first season, it's only like two or three minutes long. But Mace Windu takes on this battalion of battle droids by himself. And it's phenomenal. That's awesome. Uh, so you've traveled a lot. You've gotten to meet a lot of people um, who have made Star Wars films, who worked for Lucasfilm. Who has been one of your favorite people to meet? And can you tell us about that interaction? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I've been very, very blessed uh, in my in my travels. And I've been all around the world looking at Star Wars things and covering events. I've been to movie premieres. I've met George Lucas. Uh, but the picture that we have here, the one that I met, or that I had the longest conversation with was Harrison Ford. Now, this was at the Rise of Skywalker premiere. I walked up to him, I introduced myself, told him I was a teacher. He was instantly fascinated. I know Harrison Ford sometimes has this reputation of being something of a curmudgeon or standoffish, and maybe he is, but he was amazing to me. Think of like the coolest like uh, grandpa or uncle that you've ever had or that you've ever seen, and that was him. We talked for like uh, almost, gosh, 10 minutes about the power of writing and literature and education, and it, at the end of it, he looked me in the eye and he said, thank you for being a teacher and thank you for what you do. And it was just incredible. We got some pictures together. I got to, I got to introduce him to my wife. I actually got to say, Matthew, Harrison Ford, this is my wife, Deanna Zare. I mean, you can't write this kind of stuff. But uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a eight years of the cool things I've done, I mean, getting to chat with Harrison Ford was definitely the, the highlight for me. That's awesome. So cool. Um, we had someone put in the, the chat, and another modern example of the hero's journey could be the Hunger Games series. Absolutely. And Katniss is a great, a great example of, a, of an archetypal hero who overcomes adversity, certainly has plenty of tests, goes through her very own um, metanoia, her, changing, her change of heart, her spiritual awakening. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, here's another question for you. Do you believe that we'll see more legend characters in the near future in cinema, series, or books? I do. I think that Dave Filoni, who's one of the, the pioneers at, at Lucasfilm in this kind of this resurgence of Star Wars, he is constantly drawing from the, from the legends line in the Clone Wars, in Star Wars Rebels, uh, in a lot of the books, and stuff we've seen in The Mandalorian, and in, most likely in the book of Boba Fett, which comes out in December on Disney+. Plus. I definitely think that it's going to be a thing because you've got this rich well of all these great things. You've got this incredible canvas of Star Wars to pull from. Why not take it and make it your own? So I definitely think that we're going to see a lot of that. Cool. That's awesome. Very fun. Um, who has been your Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, your mentor in life? Well, that's a wonderful question. You know, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of mentors in my life. I mean, I had a teacher named Kelly Keogh, uh, who taught me in high school, and he was one of the first people to really get me to believe in myself mm -hmm. and to trust in who I was and to be okay with who I was without apology and with humor and, and grace and, and inner strength. And I've always carried that with me. There have been a number of teachers over the years, besides Kelly, who really inspired me. Uh, there was a substitute English teacher I had, and the way he talked about Lord of the Flies just just floored me. The excitement this guy had for literature was very inspiring to me. 
I've had a lot of great professors in my life, certainly Roberta Trites um, from Illinois State University. Uh, it helped to reinforce those things that Kelly first taught me. Uh, and they've always stuck with me. Plus, my father-in-law is a great example. Bill Phil is a great example and a, and, a, and a mentor figure to me as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those. Um, what's next for you uh, as far as Star Wars projects go? Do you have any other writing you hope to do or any other travels? Um, what are you looking forward to? Right. Well, there's, gosh, there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to going to Disney World when the, 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 the Galactic Star Cruiser opens up. It's known as the Halcyon. It is basically a Star Wars hotel. It's a two-night, three-day experience where you're immersed in the world of Star Wars like never before. There was video that Disney shared with us today that they built a lightsaber that actually turns on and extends and lights up. Um, that's great. There's going to be a Star Wars cruise next summer on the Disney, on the Disney Wish. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to Star Wars Celebration next August 2022 in Anaheim. Uh, and as far as writing stuff, I'm always open for new Star Wars adventures. I find, I mean, when I was working on the Star Wars book, I had to write, you know, a significant amount of words in a very short amount of time. And the rest of my life didn't sh slow down, but I loved it. I loved every second of it. I love the challenge. I love thinking about it. And when you write something or when you teach something, you have to think about it differently. And uh, I love it. So th there's always stuff uh, open, certainly some things I can't necessarily share right now, but there's a lot of fun stuff coming for sure. Cool. cool. Uh, here's a, a, a wonderful question. Jar Jar Binks, yay or nay? A big yay. <laughs> huge yay and i'll tell you why so i think if you're a certain age when you saw jar jar you were expecting han solo in in the swagger of a new hope and the empire strikes back and return of the jedi and we didn't get that but jar jar wasn't made for me he was made for kids i mean when i was five years old when i first saw star wars if i would have seen jar jar when i was a kid i would have loved it and i can say uh, being the proud father of three amazing uh, boys well, two of them are men now. One is still a little boy. I can tell you when Jar Jar comes on the screen, even now, they laugh like I laugh when I'm watching Seinfeld or the Three Stooges. They think he's hilarious. And I'm at best, who's the voice of Jar Jar, and he was the, the motion capture actor for Jar Jar. He's been on coffee with Kenobi before. And the man is brilliant. He lectures uh, on film in California. Um, and what he was doing was great. And I, I think Jar Jar's fun. I think he's funny. I mean, you, you and in a in a movie with some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, a boy having to leave his his mother, uh, a galaxy at, at war, uh, all challenging all these uh, ideals and philosophies that we believe in, and how politics can kind of be uh, tricky and tear the fabric of of things apart. You've got this silly Gungan who's making us laugh, and I think that's important. That's a very Shakespearean archetype, throwing in humor. Uh, it's kind of relieve some of the tension that's going on. Cool. What was it like um, getting to interact with and work with Pablo Hidalgo? It was great. Pablo is is a very unique person. Um, he's certainly a very private person. I was very lucky to have been able to have chatted with him over the years for the show at different conventions when I've been to Lucasfilm for certain things. He's just a smart guy, a really smart guy. He's written so many Star Wars books and been able to bounce ideas off of him and hear his perspective on the Skywalker family, for example, was one of the best parts about writing this book. So it was great. I love Pablo. He's he's awesome. Cool. Okay, so you mentioned that your favorite movie is Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had to pick one from the prequels and one from the sequels, to be your favorite of each uh, trilogy, what would your favorite of the prequels and sequels be? Sure. Well, uh, of the prequels, the one I watched the most is Attack of the Clones because I like all the stuff with Obi-Wan and, and all the, the Jedi stuff. But the best one of the prequels is, is certainly Revenge of the Sith. I mean, it's by far the most Shakespearean. Anakin's Fall from Grace is incredibly captivating. There's about an hour in that movie that I think is perfection. The music with, with the with the, the cost, uh, with what's going on in the galaxy, and certainly the lightsaber choreography is great. And then the sequel trilogy, there's no doubt about it, it's The Last Jedi by, by a mile. I love The Force Awakens, 
I'm not a huge fan of the Rise of Skywalker, but I love The Last Jedi. Absolutely love it. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, just a couple more questions here. Um, is there a character or concept you would like to see explored more in Star Wars in the future? Um, yes. I, I, I want to see more about Ben Solo and Luke Skywalker and their travels and, and him working with Luke for, I think, 14 years. I think he trains with Luke for 14 years to become a Jedi Knight. And I think there's a lot of material there. I would love to see something about that, like on, on the big screen or on a Disney Plus series. I think that'd be amazing. Yeah. I'd watch it for sure. That's awesome. Okay, oh, yeah. Last last question. Um, what scene out of all, all of Star Wars, whether it's movies or series, uh, what scene um, without fail gives you that Star Wars feeling every time? Oh, and I only have to pick one? Uh, the, to me, it's not only my favorite scene in, in Star Wars, but my favorite scene in all of cinema. And I consider myself a cinema a cinephile, a huge movie buff. The sequence in The Last Jedi, when and I have goosebumps talking about it, when they when they play the spark, the John Williams track, and Luke shows up on crate and he walks by and he kisses Leia on the forehead. He winks at 3PO. He walks out and faces down the First Order. All those ATM6s. Kylo Ren orders him to blast, fire all their weapons at him. The smoke clears and he brushes off his shoulder. And then that fight with Kylo Ren, it's perfection. And when I saw it in the theater, I, I got to see an early screening of that uh, in Chicago with a bunch of other media. I could not believe it. It was the sequence I had most been waiting for since 1983. And it blew me away. It is still the pinnacle of Star Wars perfection, cinema perfection to me. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Uh, one more question came in, so I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you that while we have you. What was the major catalyst behind your adventure into podcasting and social media with Star Wars? Wow. Well, that how much time do you have? That's a that's a that's a big question. But basically, uh, before when I was when I first started teaching, I had a, a commute. And I listened to books on tape, I listened to music, but eventually I just wanted something different. And then I discovered a, a medium called podcasting. And then I found a Star Wars podcast. And I was just enraptured by the notion of this basically radio program that I could carry around with me and listen to it whenever I wanted to about a number of topics. And so I kept interacting with the Star Wars show. Whenever they would share my, my stuff, like whenever they would read an email for me, or more specifically, the indie cast with Ed Dollista. Uh, I just felt this incredible charge. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I had a podcast and I could help give people that feeling too, where they could get excited to hear themselves and their thoughts on the show too. And then uh, kind of uh, consecu uh, cons at the same time with that, uh, I was teaching a, a, a class on Dracula or maybe it was Hamlin, I can't remember. And the way students were talking, I thought, man, this critical thinking is great we could totally do something like this with Star Wars. And then it occurred to me, I could start a podcast. Why don't I break down Star Wars like I do literature? And then it just kind of took on a life of itself. Uh, Corey Club, who helped co-create the show with me, he's a graphic designer. So he and I went and got coffee, of all things. And we kept coming around to Star Wars as a topic for a podcast. And so he was with me for four years. Now it'll be eight years. Um, and he still is a great friend of mine. We talk all the time. He designs all the great logos for Coffee with Kenobi, but he's got such a big family. He decided he wanted to try, you know, just focusing on that and, and it worked out really great for him. But that was kind of the inspiration for that. And social media is really fun. Um, and that's actually a great way to get to know people who are like mine and Star Wars fans too. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say thank you for, for uh, accepting that call and doing that because I know I have so enjoyed your podcast and hearing people talk and think about Star Wars in the way that I'm interested in thinking about Star Wars and all that it's um, meant for me in my life. And uh, so I, I want people to know how they can find you online and how they can hear more from you. So will you share uh, your information so people can find you? I sure will. And Matthew, thank you so much again for having me. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate, I really appreciate this so much. You can certainly find me 
on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R. You can find Coffee with Kenobi all over social media. Uh, we, I do the most on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We have our own YouTube channel. The podcast comes out twice a week. Comes out Thursdays is the regular podcast. And then Mondays is the audio version of Facebook Live, which I do every Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Love to see you there. You can certainly find my writing on StarWars.com. And if you're thinking about starting your own podcast, your own blog, or you already have one, you want to expand your brand, you can go to danzymedia.com and I can help you take your first step into the larger world of what we've got going on here. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, I want to give one announcement and then we will uh, do our drawing. I've got everyone's names written on slip of slips of paper here, but if you are in the area this Friday, we're going to keep the Star Wars love going here at Sandwich Public Library, and we're having an outdoor Star Wars party, and uh, parking will open at 630, and we're going to be having a screening of The Force Awakens out on our giant screen, and so uh, bring a lawn chair, uh, bring a jacket, it might be a little cool, it looks like the weather will be pretty nice that evening, um, but feel free to bring some snacks, uh, feel, to come, feel free to come and Costume, I will we'll definitely have my lightsaber with me. Um, so it's going to be a great time. We'll have some Star Wars trivia before the show starts. And um, so we want to make sure that you're aware that is uh, Friday, this Friday. And again, parking opens at 630. And so we hope to see you there. And uh, with that being said, let me go ahead and draw up one of these names. And I have Minta, Minta. Congratulations. Awesome. So um, you can email me at jonesm at sandwichpld.org. That's jonesm at sandwichpld.org. Let me know how I can get uh, the copy of uh, Dan's book to you, and we will make sure that we, we get that sent your way. Thank you, everyone, uh, so much for coming. Dan, thank you uh, for again for your time, for sharing May the 4th with us uh, here at the library. Uh, appreciate your time. Hey, thank you, Matthew. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining me on and joining us on Star Wars Day. It was so cool to have you all here, Mary Minta, all of uh, LJ, all of our of my good friends from Facebook Live. Thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. Keep on reading, everyone.